Hi learners, it's Em from Sano Nerds, and this video we're going to talk about thyroid physiology for the sonographer. The physiology of the organs that we're looking at can be incredibly complex. So we're going to take a kind of an overview look at the physiology of the thyroid, and it's really going to help us be better sonographers. For example, changes in the microanatomy actually is what leads to the pathologies that we can see by ultrasound. So we really do want to know what the cellular makeup is of the organs that we're looking at and how that relates back to our ultrasound images. For the thyroid being an endocrine organ, uh, it has a lot of hormones that it releases and then there's this hormonal feedback system and how the body reacts to that actually has a lot to do with how the patient then presents with their symptoms. And lastly, understanding the labs associated with the thyroid will make you better at developing differentials. Whenever we're doing patient history, we got to start thinking about what might I see on this patient. Endocrine organs are organs that create, store, and secrete hormones directly into the bloodstream. This is opposed to exocrine organs that use ducts to transport substances. The thyroid is the only organ that metabolizes iodine. It uses iodine to produce hormones. And these hormones regulate the growth and development, metabolism, and other functions of the body. The main job of the thyroid is to control your metabolism. Metabolism is a process that your body uses to transform food to energy your body uses to function. These hormones work throughout the body to tell the body cells how much energy to use. If you have too much thyroid hormone, we'll see these patients end up being very thin. But if you have too little thyroid hormone, we'll see that these patients tend to have larger bodies. This all comes back to metabolism, and we'll see later how too much or too little hormone can cause other symptoms. The thyroid hormones affect virtually every organ in the body. To better understand how the thyroid works, we're going to first take a look at the microanatomy of the thyroid. The thyroid contains follicles, which are the functional unit. The follicular cells, shown here in kind of a grayish blue, surround an area that is filled with colloid. The colloidal area plus the circle of follicular cells makes up the follicle. The follicle is a functional unit of the thyroid because it is responsible for making hormones. The thyroid also contains C cells shown here in green. These are also known as parafollicular cells because they sit next to the follicles. These cells are also a functional cell of the thyroid as they too produce a hormone. Note that there are capillaries that run near the follicles and C cells, which allow the release of hormones directly into the bloodstream. The functional cells of the thyroid are responsible for making three hormones. The follicles make thyroxine, which is abbreviated as T4, and triiodothyronine which is abbreviated as T3. These are responsible for metabolizing fats, proteins, and carbs. The C cells make calcitonin, which helps to remove calcium from the blood for storage in the bones. As with many endocrine organs, the brain and the organs talk to one another via the bloodstream. Therefore, the thyroid releases hormones based on a feedback system. The feedback loop starts when the hypothalamus detects that there are low levels of thyroid hormones, T3 and T4. The hypothalamus then is going to release thyrotropin releasing hormone, or TRH. The increase of TRH will then tell the pituitary gland to produce thyroid stimulating hormone, or TSH. The TSH will travel through the bloodstream and eventually interact with the cells of the thyroid gland. The increase in TSH is going to tell the thyroid then to make T3, triiodothyronine, and T4, thyroxine. The increase in levels of the thyroid hormones 
are detected then by the hypothalamus, and it will stop production of TRH, thus halting the TSH production, which will stop the T3 and T4 production. The body will use the T3 and T4 that has been produced, causing the blood levels to dip again, and the cycle will start over. To understand better how the thyroid is functioning, blood tests can be done for levels of TSH, T3, and T4. A normal functioning thyroid gland is called euthyroidism. In a normally functioning thyroid, all blood work will come back normal. TSH, T4, and T3 will be in the normal functioning range. When the thyroid gland is not producing enough hormones, it is considered an underactive thyroid, which is called hypothyroidism. Hypothyroidism comes in two categories. Primary hypothyroidism results from the thyroid gland itself not functioning. In this scenario, TSH is high because the pituitary gland is trying to get the thyroid to make hormone. So it just keeps pumping out TSH, thinking eventually it will get the thyroid to make T3 and T4. But because the thyroid is not functioning appropriately, T3 and T4 remain low. The other type of hypothyroidism is secondary hypothyroidism. And this is a result of a non-functioning pituitary gland. The pituitary gland does not respond to the hypothalamus's TRH, therefore it does not produce TSH, so TSH is low. When there's no TSH, the thyroid won't get the message to make T3 and T4, causing those levels to also be low. There are multiple symptoms that come along with hypothyroidism. An easy mnemonic device is mom's so tired. People with hypothyroidism tend to be very sluggish, very tired, and also tend to be female. So this mnemonic device helps out in more than one way. We also see with hypothyroidism that there's a lot of brain fog or memory loss. Uh, we tend to see larger bodies, period disruption, and a big one is intolerance to cold. That means that people with hypothyroidism tend to feel colder, especially in kind of moderate temperatures. Opposite of the underfunctioning thyroid gland is an overactive thyroid gland, which is called hyperthyroidism. Hyperthyroidism is when the thyroid is producing too much hormone. This can be due to a malfunction of the thyroid gland itself or a nodule within the gland. In hyperthyroidism, the thyroid is producing too much hormone, so the hypothalamus never gets the message to produce TRH, which means the pituitary gland doesn't produce TSH, making TSH levels low and T4 and T3 levels high. Hyperthyroidism is also associated with a lot of key symptoms, and we can use the mnemonic device of sweating to help us remember those. Sweating itself is a symptom of hyperthyroidism. People with hyperthyroidism are going to have higher metabolisms, and along with that, we see a lot of weight loss. We'll see appetite being increased. The energy that the cells are using is higher, so we see a faster heart rate. Opposite of hypothyroidism, we see that hyperthyroidic people have an intolerance to heat. So again, in moderate temperatures, people with hyperthyroidism are probably going to feel a little bit hotter than your average person. Understanding the difference between hyperthyroidism and hypothyroidic symptoms is going to be very important. As you are reviewing patient symptoms or going through a history with them, you'll see that those with hypothyroidism do complain of weight gain and being tired and cold and all of that, where those with hyperthyroidism pathologies are going to complain of being hot all the time, can't gain weight, excessive sweating, uh, wanting to eat all the time, that kind of stuff. So you should start to see patterns in the hypo versus hyperthyroidic patients.